Hello and welcome to another edition of the UK Law Weekly podcast with me, your host, Marcus Cleaver. This week we're going to be looking at the case of Konechny and District Court in Brno Venkov, and the citation for this case is 2019 UKSC 8. And this case concerns the legal device known as the European Arrest Warrant, which is an important legal tool used within the European Union to facilitate the arrest and transfer of an individual from one member state to another. Say someone commits a crime in Greece and escapes to Ireland, Ireland would send the criminal back to Greece. That is the sort of scenario that is envisioned. The person at the heart of this case is Carol Konechny, who in 2008 was convicted in absentia on three counts of fraud amounting to a total sum of around £120,000. Those convictions and the decision to sentence him to eight years in prison for his crimes were taken in Brno, which is in the south of the Czech Republic. In order to get Konechny to actually serve this sentence, a European arrest warrant was issued in 2013. That warrant made two things clear, which, while not contradictory, can be seen to lead to two different conclusions. First of all, the warrant is based on the conviction and enforceable judgment from the Brno court in 2008. Secondly, it states that Konechny will be entitled to a full retrial when he returns. The question then is whether he ought to be recognised as a convicted person in line with the original judgement, or as an accused person in light of the potential retrial. This is important because it affects how much time has passed in the meantime. The conviction takes us back to 2008, whereas if Konechny remains as someone who is merely accused of the crimes, then we have to go all the way back to the commission of those offences in late 2004. Konechny wanted that longer time period because there is a bar to extradition available under Section 14 of the Extradition Act 2003, where the passage of time would make it, quote, unjust or oppressive to extradite, end quote. To support this further, arguments were made that such an extradition would also be a breach of the rights of two private and family life under Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. When the case went before the district judge in the UK, he was not exactly convinced by these arguments. For him, this was a case that related to a convicted person, and so the time bar was to be considered as running from 2008 rather than 2004. His conclusion was that an extradition in these circumstances would not be unjust or oppressive. Furthermore, when he carried out the balancing act in relation to Article 8, he held that the public interest in the extradition outweighed the right to private and family life. The High Court was in agreement, but the judges in that case added that this question regarding the time period that should be used was of sufficient importance that it should be answered by the Supreme Court, and so that is where we pick it up. The justices began by noting the key principles that underpin the legal regime of the European arrest warrant. In particular, there is an idea of mutual trust and confidence between member states of the EU, and this should not only be respected but actually put into practice when deciding cases like this. What exactly do they mean by this? Well, the way that the individual is described in the warrant and the status that they are attributed is to be given significant weight. In other words, if a person, such as Konechny, is described as having been convicted rather than merely accused of the named crimes, then while that is by no means decisive, it will be persuasive. Beyond this general principle, the Supreme Court also offered some guidelines that lower courts should follow. For a start, each case should be considered in the context of the law of the member state that is making the request. Statements about that law made on and in relation to the warrant will be taken as accurate, although contradicting evidence can be admitted in a case. When considering a conviction, that conviction should be both binding and enforceable under the law of the requesting member state. However, that does not necessarily mean that the conviction itself has to be completely irrevocable, and so in cases like this where there is a right to a retrial, that does not impact the convicted status. Ultimately, this meant that Konechny was considered as someone who had been convicted, and therefore the passage of time ran from 2008 rather than 2004. The district judge was entitled to enforce the extradition on this basis, and had taken appropriate account of the balancing act required under Article 8. As a starting point for our analysis of this case, we can look to a criticism of the law that was made by Lord Lloyd-Jones in the lead judgment. 
He noted that Section 14 does not make sufficient provision for situations like this where there is a right to a retrial and time has passed since the original conviction. This construction has the potential to put people like Konechny in a disadvantageous position compared to other appellants. Article 8 does ameliorate this somewhat as it requires consideration to be given to that person's human rights before a final decision is made, but that might not swing the balance in an individual's favour where the case sits in a grey area. The justices went so far as to say that they hope that this hole in the legislation will be fixed as soon as possible, and I have to say that a fault like this is pressing where a person's liberty is at stake. Of course, our own discussion would not be complete without discussing the topic of the day, and seemingly every day since forever, Brexit. On the face of it, retaining the European arrest warrant after the UK leaves the EU is a no-brainer, because, as we discussed earlier on in the podcast, this is a legal mechanism that is beneficial for all of the member states involved. However, depending on the type of Brexit that eventually happens, this will be easier said than done. The system does not stand on its own and is reliant on other key elements of the European Union legal and political framework, such as the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, free movement of persons, and oversight by the European Court of Justice. The relationship between the UK and all of these things is very much up in the air, and, in all honesty, are unlikely to make it into a final agreement. So, does that mean it is dead in the water? Well, it certainly means it is going to be difficult to negotiate an agreement on this subject, but it is important not to forget that there is motivation on both sides to keep the current arrangements in place. The main worry is that this is yet another area where the UK is trying to have its cake and eat it, but this time the government's inherent failure on this subject will lead to a substantive dent in the UK's security. Well, thank you very much for tuning in to another episode of the UK Law Weekly Podcast, and thanks as ever to bensound.com who provides the theme music. Remember, if you want to find out more, you can go to my website, which is uklawweekly.com, or you can find me on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Marcus Cleaver. I'll be back with another case next week, but for now, bye!